yes, hello again, part two. Um, because, of course, now I feel like I have left you there in the middle of all this misery with an analysis, hopefully, of what I can see now are the elements in both our personalities, okay? Um, loneliness and isolation and devaluation, basically, being uh, core concepts and all that. Um, I feel like I am not completely done because I hadn't really finished the chronological tale anyway. So uh, I just said that we, you know, moved, what we did was we moved house several more times afterwards. My grandfather, my mother passed away and I started oil painting afterwards. So that was in 96 that I actually... Uh, bought a couple of tubes of oil paint and some turpentine and some other brushes and stuff, you know, and canvases and started just doodling away with that and finding very quickly that I enjoyed that, doing that enormously. I find it funny and interesting that I find that I have to talk about this as well so this is going just to be another part two I hope I'm not going to be another 50 minutes because wow <laughs> I do feel better because naming the thing makes it easier you know slightly apparently that's how the brain works you just have to decide you know this is a thing and that's what I'm going to call it and then you see what happens, okay, after that. You just have to um, do a bit of self-determination, <laughs> literally, in all directions. And oil painting, for me, has been instrumental. Uh, however, it wasn't enough. After a few years, like around 2000 or so, I was still doing my volunteer work at the, uh, at the fair trade shop. That involved also buying for the shop, and I started... Uh, buying uh, the incense that we sold in the shop and that's how I got in contact with those people of that incense company where um, I uh, subsequently started work actually paid work as a not an employee but a uh, an independent uh, sales representative sort of a some semi franchise type organized uh, structure that was and I had got my driving license, which was like, hallelujah, uh, you know, autonomy and being able to move around and do my own things for a bit. And so, of course, the first few years of that were ex excellent. You know, it was a lot of work. It was hard work. And a lot of it was really physical and really challenging And with people. It was really challenging because, of course, I had no clue what to do with people and what people were doing with me, you know, so... In hindsight, I go like, oh my god, I can't believe I actually went and did that. And I was really scared in the beginning. My mother had been gone for quite a while. And the earliest, when I was deciding whether or not to go start work there, I had this immense anxiety whether she would have disapproved. You know, she wasn't around anymore. So... That's the level of dysfunctionality that I'm talking about here. I remember being on holiday, because we always went on holidays, whether we had money or not, with husband in Switzerland on a hill, on a mountain somewhere, on a glacier, actually, and me being sort of in a state of hysterical anxiety, fragmenting all over again, all over the glacier were bits of me, like, and at some point, I just went through this tiny, teeny existential warp hole, you know, into, okay, I'm going to do it. I don't remember how I decided anything. I have no journal. Just thinking about it and talking about it now, I just go like, oh, my God, you know. And then only, you know, of course, everything after that only got more complicated because it, nothing, just not, there's never one single solution. There's never one single awareness, one single revelation, realization, and then you're done. That's what I keep thinking. 
because I'm stupid that way. And I just want to, you know, go off and enjoy myself, basically. Because Leo, and, you know, I don't care. <laughs> oh my God, you know, you guys. <laughs> I started work. The first few years were excellent fun. Challenging sometimes because I found that I reacted and responded to people in charge as I used to respond to my mother, only slightly more explicitly with more fear and less control and it was very confusing. Then we had to move house again and that was a huge travail and not asking for help, not being, not having ever learned how to ask for help it was a nightmare. It was causing more trouble, more problems. Nobody understood why I was like that at the, you know, at the office or on in the warehouse. And I can't blame them because everybody else grows up with some type of a network. So hence the probable necessity for me to go into this whole second and third generation war victims thing again because you know it's the only profitable useful thing that I can think of to do at the moment and um, there's traits there's traits that have been sort of made objective and in a way being being the uh, next generation offspring of people who are so severely traumatized by concentration camps, persecution, um, whether Jewish or anywhere else really in the world, doesn't matter. The violence is the same. The suffering is the same. And you grow up as a kid, depending on your personality, I guess, um, I guess I was always trying to help, but I wasn't really available because of my own soul loss story. And I still don't really know whether my whole soul retrieval story isn't like me retrieving an emotionally functioning, healthy, capable agency capable you know part of myself recuperating that part out of some hyper space dimension somewhere else you know who cares whether it was actually the 14th century or whether it was just parked in another in another dimension how much does that really matter it worked this way for me that i actually couldn't really be hurt that badly and one example of that is we have one of our two cats our white Austrian cat uh, Sebastian he is a bit ill he's had a bit of a stomach trouble and we're going to take him to the vet tomorrow end of the afternoon so we're hoping that he will, will be okay again because he's been you know vomiting and having belly aches and things and um He's been around for 13 years in our lives. He's been through all this with both of us. And he's been a loyal friend and a sensitive friend. And I have always been able to say goodbye to cats really easily. Because I, well, one thing is I never grew up with pets myself. So I had never had any relationship with any pets before meeting my husband. But whenever a cat got really sick and it was like, you know, this moment where you have to decide, well, it's the best thing for them to just um, euthanize them, then I used to vote for that always. I voted basically for the easy option out for all of us. And now what with, you know, restoration and purification and all that, I find it a lot less easy. I think that I'm also realizing that I feel a lot more responsible for how this cat leaves this world than before. Because I have power to you have him euthanized whenever I feel like it's not it's not going to be um, you know, it's not gonna work. 
and one really miserable uh, part of the equation is money. Because how many hundreds of euros can I afford to spend on, on him? How much good is it going to do? Difficult things. So I feel this is a really tangible example of how I have changed. Because back in the day, it was like, I don't know, just give him the, give him the syringe, done, you know, and we will deal with our loss ourselves and whatever. It's just part of the thing. And to some extent, I will still be able to, I think, uh, decide that whenever the time comes, uh, together with my husband, of course, but we will both be, we will be mourning this cat. We will be grieving whenever he finally uh, has to leave us. And he's sitting right there outside and he has uh, sort of lived on that uh, little wooden construction that I've got there in the middle of my uh, patio here that I used to normally set my co cup of coffee on or uh, my journal or something like that. He's been uh, sort of hanging around sitting there for the past um, four or five days or so uh, intermittently, uh, basically mostly asleep. And uh, he's he's coping. Is each time I come out or he comes into the house, he is fairly cheerful. It's not like he's completely and utterly miserable. So it's really hard to decide at this point. We can't decide anything for now, and so the vet will have to tell us what's really going on with him, and um, maybe things can still be resolved. But he's also losing weight, so he's, you, you can tell he's getting skinny, even though he's still got this huge fur. You know, it's really hard sometimes to tell with cats. I don't know whether it's the same thing with dogs, but um, with all the fur, he still looks fairly fluffy. But if you feel, you can feel all his bones and you can count his bones in his ribs, it's not good, I think. So there's been a problem, probably it's a thyroid problem. And then um, the medications for thyroid problems are really expensive. So yeah, all that. And... Um, Getting back to the patterns, I'm trying to sort of leave that now and get back to the patterns because I think it's really important to um, sort of get clear indications as much as possible. An indication for somebody who grows up with war victims is that you sort of get the message that you have to do everything yourself. My husband has exactly that same uh, habit of wanting to do every last little thing that he needs himself. Less nowadays. He started, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, realizing that, um, and that it also links up with the whole money issue and the value issue of all sorts of things, because that's another sore spot with him, um, that you can actually do things together, that one guy does one thing and the other guy does another thing, and then at the end of the day you have two things done. That's possible. So here we have somebody who used to, until six years ago, have employees working for him. That's really screwed up. Here we have somebody who really wants to do every last single thing, including buying stamps, driving to the client, uh, you know, getting um, laundry done, uh, hoovering, making dinner, doing the dishes, everything. He wants to do everything. And to some extent, he's been extraordinarily helpful to me, of course, because he tends to just, you know, do the dishes like... That's the easiest and most self-evident type of job that he... Uh, he doesn't mind doing the dishes. But I have had to sort of... Basically, the problem that we had was around money and uh, not even necessarily overspending because I, apart from holidays, which we tended to, you know, splurge on more than was really clever... Um, it was just back then, it was sort of impossible to get him to talk about um, the amount of money that we had and the amount of 
cost and expenses, how those two are related to each other. So, and not so much nowadays, even though it's sort of an echo of it is still there. Um, it's like it's none of my business, which is really old school. I mean, that's Victorian age where the woman is supposed to just get <laughs> household money for to do, you know, purchases and things for the house. And not, otherwise not know anything about anything. That's really old school. <laughs> so, and him being, you know, in often in a state of bewilderment as to how to get costs and expenses and income um, organized, also with income fluctuating a lot, of course, back in those days. Nowadays, he's an employee himself. Income is fixed and a lot of our expenses is also fixed. So now we have a sort of a solid base that is always operating. And from each month to the next, it's easy to say, okay, we've got this much left over for food and this much left over for tarot decks and this much left over for, you know, going out for a coffee. And there's still, it's, there's a system now, nowadays, but back in the days, I always felt like I can help you. I can help. Well, let's talk about this. Let's just have an in an exchange of information. Let's have a, but his des level of desperation with the expenses that uh, we had and an expensive house and an expensive mortgage at the time, it was just too much for him. And his response to a desperate situation was to clam up completely. And that, I think, um, is more of a genetic. Some people go and talk a lot when they're desperate and some people clam up and not another word comes out of them. And so I wouldn't necessarily see either of those uh, responses as being due to any kind of trauma, whether lost twin trauma or war victim trauma or soul loss or any of it, because I think that those three are my categories really that I tend to go to. Um, it's just very much a personal thing. And of course, since a human being depends a great deal in his relationship on exchange of information, then all that is going to be really problematic. Uh, if you don't, uh, if you don't sort things out, especially if you're involved, I was involved. I'm married to this guy. I am, I was also at the time, um, something I was adamant about. We had to be in a... Um, I don't know what that's called. Here you go again. Ah, oh, like a company structure uh, that we shared. That I was, we were in it together. Me with my incense uh, sales rep activities and him with his uh, clients. So we were one uh, structure as a, we were one company basically, uh, tax wise also. And actually I think that I've helped him get this stuff sorted out better because I was actually part of it. But he has such a hard time explaining himself. He used, of course, his, um, let's call it academic jar jargon, you know, his Creole <laughs> that they use on in the office, most of which to me was less easy to understand than Hebrew of which I don't understand anything at all. So each time if I felt like he was taking it out on me, which was really uncomfortable. And so you see how there's a whole mutual network, like a web of conflicting tendencies and fears and anger and ex the expression that comes out any old how anywhere lightning flashes all over and all you can do is muscle up and cope put your big person panties on so to speak and cope anyway and just you never have time you never have the opportunity and looking at myself and my life what's happened to me in the past six years I took the time 
I took the opportunity to think about things and to to get really close to my own experience of things and to decide which energies were part of myself and why and hence my video making I think so this is uh, I think a better conclusion to the story uh, as we have it now um, I was really upset to detect the lost twin behavior patterns of um, devaluation and isolation in our direct past, in our direct experiences, in my direct, immediately accessible memories, that close, and I hadn't seen it. So I was shocked by that. And then it took me a while to sort of simmer down again and to nowadays. Now at this point, I think I've sort of explained everything more or less in relation to each other. And I hope it may do some good out there to anyone um, to whom this is relevant. Okay. And it's just to some extent, it's relevant to a lot of us. So good luck to you. And thank you again for watching. And uh, sorry for the lengthiness and the, uh, the rambliness. I, I still hope it makes uh, it makes sense. Okay, so sort of survivor number two, three here, and um, we'll stick it all in a playlist. Okay, thank you. Bye bye.